This man became something more than simply a sportsman. The first great player. It always used to be a sort of gaping crowd. Brilliant athlete. He can run 100 yards in almost world record time. He looms over cricket. Physically intimidating presence. The figures are absolutely awe-inspiring. W.G. Grace. Gilbert Grace, as they called him. It's been 100 years since he died, on October the 23rd, 1915. And in that time, the real man seems to have vanished beneath his own mythology. I'm standing outside the last house he lived in, on a street in suburban South London. Nottingham, to be precise. I used to pass this place every day, walking to and from school. I came to feel a great affinity with the elderly Grace that lived at Fairmount. So instead of the striding colossus in cricket pads and MCC cap of common folk memory, I pictured, and still picture, an old man in the twilight of his life. And Lord's looking wonderful on this lovely summer's day. And here comes Dr Grace leading the team down the pavilion steps here. Huge crowd in, a sea of straw boaters. This match has actually been put back a week in order to coincide with Dr Grace's 50th birthday. His reaction to the crowd is a slightly embarrassed military-style salute. Lord's Cricket Ground, the showpiece fixture of the season. Grace, the doctor, leads the gentlemen, the amateurs. They're batting against the players, the professionals, effectively the second-class citizens of the sport. Well, this partnership has been going on for a long time now. There are only 15 minutes left in the day for the gentlemen to survive, and Grace and Courtright have been battling away. They're not the best of friends. More on that later. Grace leaning on his bat, massive figure at the non-striker's end. Can they hold on? Courtright faces Lockwood. Oh, it's up in the air, it's going out towards cover. Haig is running back. Oh, he's taken the catch. It's all over. And Lockwood has taken the final wicket. Courtright has been dismissed. The players have beaten Dr Grace's gentleman's team. One man who knows all about that match is the historian and writer David Kiniston. We're very high up in the Lord's Pavilion in the, in the members' tea room. A uh, very hallowed place to be. I'm quite nervous about being in here myself. But David, what was the significance of the 1898 Gentlemen versus Players game for WG Grace? Well, it marked, I think, more than any other moment, the apogee of the golden age of English cricket, that era between, say, 1890 and 1914, that one now looks back on as something very special indeed. This gentleman versus players occasion, was it a turning point? I guess it was a turning point in, in Grace's life, because in a sense it was all to be gently downhill from there on. He had really let his body go. I mean, his weight had become enormous, and he did drink too much, eat too much, and so on. Uh, but he had such formidable powers of concentration and, of course, know-how that he, he wasn't an easy guy to drop. He'd been a brilliant sportsman, athlete and innovator. Commentator John Arlott, the voice of cricket, was certainly a fan. Grace turned cricket not only into a respectable game, he turned it into the most popular game England has ever known. He was, in other words, cricket's eminent Victorian. But these figures are shattering. Virtually 99,000 runs. Once on a country cricket ground where it was hoped he would go to play, the notice outside said, cricket match, admission sixpence. If W.G. Grace plays, admission a shilling. That's how big he was. Richard Tomlinson wrote Grace's most recent biography. He really exploded two cultures, one of which was the amateurs who saw cricket, at least in terms of the rhetoric they used, as kind of like a code for chivalry and honour, that that was what mattered. And he also actually undermined this rather sort of beery circus and skittles culture of the professionals because he set out to play cricket as a deeply deeply serious business and only to win the only film footage we have of the doctor in action is of him playing four shots in the nets at hastings it's 1901 and grace is 53 years old in this brief flickering footage we're given a tantalizing look at the greatest sportsman of the age i took the middlesex and england batsman nick compton back in time treating him to a fourpenny seat to see a newfangled moving picture. Together we watched a large, familiar figure deftly wielding a cricket bat, trousers fastened high using a necktie as a belt. We 
can see him here just picking up the bat quite loosely. It seems like he's whipping the ball off the leg stump, which is something that wasn't entirely the done thing at that time, but players clearly caught on pretty quickly. You see a lot of modern day players hitting through the leg sides. You know, very relaxed, you know, quite gentlemanly like. He's not exactly a, a light individual, is he? He's a fairly big chap, so he obviously gave the ball a good whack. Photographs, drawings, caricatures. Grace's unique appearance was a godsend to the fledgling mass media of Victorian England. Not since Holbein painted Henry VIII had a rotund man's image been so ubiquitous. It remains in our collective folk memory even today. They had an enormous beard. We all know that, don't we? I suppose not just the beard, but the physical girth. Big beard. Um, I, believe, I think he was very tall, from my understanding. A terrific, huge personality. A very fearsome-looking character. Everybody knew the old man and his beard. He'd be deemed overweight by the physiotherapists and company. Intolerant of any form of ineptitude. Nice big beard. Bearded. Grace's beard was longer. The most instantly recognisable man in England at that time. Supposedly, Grace never shaved in his life. He had the kind of beard that would turn a Russian novelist green with envy. The thing even had its own anecdotes. Major James Gilman played with Grace at the turn of the century, and here he is in 1966. Uh, Jones, the Australian fast bowler, supposed to build a ball bumper through his beard. Well, the actual story is it wasn't a bumper at all. It was a full pitch straight at him, which he just put his head back slightly and it went under his chin and as there was a beard on it, it went through the beard. He said, steady, Jonah. And Jonah said, sorry, doctor, it's, she slipped. <laughs> his fame earned him a central role in plenty of commercial ventures. In 1899, having given up his medical practice in Bristol, Grace moved to South London to run the newly formed London County Cricket Club, based at the Crystal Palace. This was a first-class team set up primarily to make money. They played exhibition matches against some of the finest opposition in the world. But Grace was two-timing his old club, Gloucestershire, who were understandably a bit put out. The club's committee foolishly expressed these reservations to the great man in a suitably peeved letter. Grace responded... I have always tried my very best to promote the interests of the Gloucestershire County Club, and it is with deep regret I resign the captaincy. This wasn't some negligent casting error, by the way. He apparently actually spoke like this, with an incongruous, high-pitched West Country accent. I have the greatest affection for the county of my birth, but for the committee, as a body, the greatest contempt. I am yours truly, W.G. Grace. In April 1908, Grace played his last first-class game. It was at the Oval. He captained the Gentlemen of the South against Surrey, but the weather was freezing. The crowd was tiny, thinner than the layer of snow on the outfield. Two months later, he turned 60. All sporting careers come to an end. Vic Marks, formerly of Somerset in England, moved on and became a journalist. Grace just kept playing, didn't he? Um, people would beg him to play, no doubt, after he'd stopped playing for Gloucester, maybe even stopped playing for London County. And my feeling is that there's a sadness about him because he recognised his body wouldn't allow him to excel. He could still pick up the ball, probably. He could probably still bat, but he couldn't run. <laughs> and he would be probably became a liability in the field. It's all over, Jacker, or something he said to one of his colleagues. He was a brilliant sportsman. He wasn't a great politician. He probably wasn't a great thinker. He was probably a very competent doctor, but what he was brilliant at was playing cricket. In these heady years of the Edwardian period, aristocrats praised his achievements in their country piles, gentlemen in their Pall Mall clubs, while down the road he was being fated from the stages of the music halls. His fame was that widespread. I've dug out a piece of sheet music from the rare books room at the British Library. It's a song which was inspired by WG that probably hasn't been performed since the heyday of the music halls in Edwardian England. I put it in the hands of Will Grove White from the Ukulele Orchestra of Great Britain. I read the Daily Telegraph's account of Dr Grace And thought upon the scroll of fame my name I'd like to place I gave a man a five pound note to teach me in a day I said my grace, I took my place and then prepared to play The Authors' Eleven are a club that could be said to embody the intellectual side of the game 
Now these guys are probably not WG's crowd at all. I went to see them play on a glorious late summer day in rural Oxfordshire. They were taking on the Bodleian Library, a bookish fixture more likely to be decided by the Dewey Decimal System than the Duckworth Lewis method. Good on, lads. I'm with the uh, historian and it must be said six hitter Tom Holland. Uh, Tom, if I said WG Grace to you, what were the first things that came to mind? Um, I would imagine like everyone else, beard because he is such an iconic figure and his physical presence is such a crucial part of that. I suppose not just the beard, but the physical girth. And it seems emblematic of, I suppose, of Victorian Britain at its most self-confident, its most solid, its most world-conquering. Was he used as an example of a, a certain type of English masculinity, do you think? I suppose in the sort of the pantheon of cultural icons, he's sort of halfway between um, Byron and Rudolf Valentino. But of course, unlike Byron or Rudolf Valentino, <laughs> sylph-like good looks isn't necessarily what you'd associate with him. So instead, it is very much that his prowess on sporting fields at a time when the Victorians regarded prowess on a sports field as absolutely the index of moral quality. Historian Peter Frankopan, what does the name W.G. Grace mean to you? It's interesting as a historian, I think, to look back on people who were self-selecting at the time, or well, the Victorians selected Grace as their archetypal figure of everything that was good about a British man alive in the empire um, in the late, later 19th century. I suppose the funny counterpoint is that Grace being the hero, we also have the villain, and in Victorian society, that's Oscar Wilde. And in fact, during the Oscar Wilde trial, Grace was publicly compared in Punch magazine and elsewhere to being the sort of the best of everything British in the way that Wilde was the worst. So I'm sitting looking across the ground with Nicholas Hogg, the novelist and co-founder of the current incarnation of The Author's Eleven. Nick, W.G. Grace, a true representation of Englishness, do you think? Would he be an iconic figure for a, a, a lad from a crap comprehensive school in Leicester? Yeah, he's, he's a particular archetype for a particular type of cricket and a particular period that perhaps your average kind of working class cricketer might not look upon with such reverence. The authors were all out for 175 and went on to win by 26 runs. Have that, librarians. And I looked so grand as I took my stand And the band began to play Grace never seemed outwardly concerned with culture or politics. He just wanted to compete. He was an all-round sportsman and enjoyed... Sprinting, balls, beagling, shooting, curling, golf... Never tennis. Ghastly effeminate game. His enthusiasm for sport didn't extend to women's cricket, though. Baroness Rachel Hayhoe Flint is a former England captain and pioneer of the women's game. Women did have an influence on W.G. Grace because his mother, Martha Grace, was actually his fiercest critic and used to go along and watch him play every day and she became a great expert. And you've done more than most to puncture the elitist boys' club image <laughs> of cricket. Um, do you think Grace, or at least Grace's image, helped to perpetuate that? In some of his anecdotes, he wrote that a new chapter, a short one, was added to the annals of cricket by the appearance this season of two elevens of lady cricketers. But interest in their doings did not survive long. Cricket is not a game for women, and although the fair sex occasionally join in the picnic game, they are not constitutionally adapted for the sport. I wish he could have seen the England women playing a day-night 2020 match and 15,000 people turned up to watch them. Grace's approach to gender was firmly rooted in the Victorian era, but his approach to personal hygiene was based in a more rustic and unsanitary age. Wicketkeeper Alfred Littleton noted that Grace had the dirtiest neck he ever kept wicket behind. Emma John, writer and journalist. WG looms there like in exactly the same way he looms as he's Monty Python's vision of God isn't he in um, Monty Python and the Holy Grail Arthur King of the Britons Oh, don't grovel. One thing I can't stand, it's people grovelling Sorry And he looms over cricket in exactly the same way I actually really came to him through CLR James and his book Beyond a Boundary he actually devotes several chapters to WG because he is looking at what WG as a person can tell us about 
history. I got it into my head that W.G. Grace had played a tremendous role in the Britain that we have today, and without him the game would never have been what it became. Because he's rarely mentioned in the leading general histories of the Victorian age and of the times he lived in. But the way James writes about it, he sounds outraged that WG doesn't get more mention in histories of the time. James's argument is that far from being the ultimate Victorian, WG Grace was actually what James calls a pre-Victorian. He brought some of the old England and forced a place for it in the new England. And the people came to see because they were looking at something that they had inside of them. And therefore Grace is a historical figure. A hangover from the pastoral, the rustic England of the turn of the 19th century. The Victorians just adopted him as their symbol. James says that WG enjoyed life, that he ate and drank prodigiously. He didn't have the same restraint and moralising attitude of the Victorians that he, he lived amongst. Just as Grace is remembered for his physical appearance, he's also remembered for, let's say, interpreting the rules of the game to his own advantage. Take the 1898 Gloucestershire-Essex match at Leighton. Grace is facing Charlie Courtright, the fastest bowler in the land. It's the last day. The match is in the balance. Courtright hairs in and bowls. How is that? He appears to have Grace plum leg before wicket. WG fixes a steely glare upon umpire George Bolton, practically saying... Give me out. I dare you. <clears throat> not out. Not out, George, not out. They could hear that snick in Chelmsford. Courtright is furious. He stomps back to his mark. He tears in for the next delivery, which Grace promptly edges loudly to the wicketkeeper. How is that? Again, Grace stands his ground. Again, he treats the umpire to a defiant stare. Not out. You can practically see lightning playing around the bowler's temples. Courtright thunders in again. He unleashes the next delivery, and it's one so fast that even Grace is still prodding forward as two of his stumps go cartwheeling out of the ground. How is that? WG tucks his bat under his arm and starts the walk back to the pavilion. Surely you're not leaving us, Doctor. There's one stump still standing. How dare he? I've never been so insulted in all my life. Grace toured Australia twice in the winters of 1873 and 1891. In England, Grace's rule-flouting idiosyncrasies were indulged. On his tours to Australia, less so. They hated him from the beginning. Cricket writer Gideon Haig. He behaves in Australia like a kind of a pantomime villain, um, the personification of the uptight Englishman who disdains the colonials. Because he's a man who knows his commercial value to the last farthing, he charges the Australians an absolutely usurious fee of £1,500 plus expenses plus getting the Australians to pay for his honeymoon as well. And Australians, who I think really want to welcome him, they really want to, to genuflect to him, find him to be a bit of a graven idol. These days, Grace would have raked it in. And one can only imagine what a filthy rich WG would have got up to. Cars, swimming pools, diamond ear studs. His entire career would have been a long list of endorsements and sponsorship deals, but back then cricket was not supposed to be played for the money. It was a gentleman's game. Richard Tomlinson. He'd endorse anything, but I think one of the things that's quite endearing about Grace is he's just hopeless at it, because really what he wants to do is just play cricket. He's not canny in that way. And one of the things I never got to the bottom of was the image on the front of my cover, which is Coleman's Mustard, which was produced probably in 1895. Now, that is one of the most famous advertising images in history. But would you know that Unilever, which owns the brand now, doesn't have any record of a contract, nor does Coleman's Mustard, the company itself. It Maybe it existed, maybe it was some informal arrangement, but you have to consider the possibility that Grace wasn't even paid for that. Grace never seemed truly rich. The house I used to pass every day is a large and imposing one, but it's not the sprawling mansion befitting a national hero. He obviously had a lot of money coming in. What happened to it? He doesn't, when he dies, leave very much. And there was a rumour at the time in 1895 that a lot of the money he got for the testimonial he used to pay off gambling debts. As well as the gambling, you've discovered that, contrary to the image that has been handed down to us, he, he liked to drink. 
by his 40s, he's really drinking very heavily. And he's doing this a lot with younger cricketers. He's one of these drinkers who I think needed company to make himself feel like he's not alone. Now, we're perhaps getting closer to the man. He was a genius, certainly, but one with distinctly human frailties. But a century has passed, and cricket as a sport is scarcely recognisable. Runs that matter, not how you get them. It's a very quick outfield. But WG Grace, more than anyone else of his generation, still seems to have a presence at the wicket. Nick Compton. I think growing up, when you're a young guy, the only history that matters is probably the heroes at hand. I think as you get to play a bit more and you realise that there is a great legacy to the game, which I think in turn gives you that respect, that humility for your sport, but it also gives you a good comparison to what has been done in the past and how good some of these players were. I mean, WG Grace for me was really the founder of, of cricket, whose statistics and numbers and what he achieved in the game was so far superior. The first man to get a triple century, the first man to get a hundred hundreds. He was a man who started things. You know, you look at A.B. de Villiers, who's you know, become the sort of 360 degree player. Um, you think of the Joss Butlers who do these flips over their head. You know, he was that type of guy. Um, he was the Jacques Callas, you know, who, who perhaps got the volume of runs, but at the same time was the Freddie Flintoff who people came through the gates to watch. You know, he was the reason why ticket sales went up. He was very stressed by just the whole business of being as great as he was. The pressure he must have felt to go out and do it again and not disappoint people must have been immense. And then I think what is also unavoidable is the possibility that he was doing this drinking as some way of escape or solace from what was going on in his family life because he lost his daughter Bessie in 1899 and that was just the most traumatic thing she was by all accounts this healthy happy athletic girl she played cricket until in a rather old-fashioned way he stopped her playing she goes down with typhoid and it takes seven weeks he he signs the death certificate as the witness at her bedside and there was nothing he could do two of his sisters died the following year and then his son Bertie dies in 1905 from a what sounds like a botched appendix operation and, and two of his cricketing friends committed suicide as well. Well, didn't well they? indeed, indeed. And I think he was very untypical Victorian in the same way as Queen Victoria, in that he was very emotional and the emotions he wore very openly. When the war breaks out in 1914, and he writes this famous letter I think the time has arrived when the county cricket season should be closed. For it is not fitting at a time like this that able-bodied men should be playing cricket by day and pleasure-seekers looking on. And what he did see coming through Mottingham was the troops going off to the the front. So he really felt that the the slaughter of of these young soldiers, he he really, really took it to heart. Um, it It wasn't a happy last few years of his life at all. The war truly came to South East London on the 7th of September 1915. Just before midnight, Zeppelin LZ-74 drifted high over the Tower of London, before turning southeast to drop bombs on Bermondsey, Rotherhithe and Deptford. Grace was sitting up late, catching up with his correspondence. What the blazes! It's work done, the Zeppelin turned for home, flying over Grace in his sleepy suburb. As the malicious hum of the engine grew louder, Grace hurried through the house and into the garden. The greatest cricketer that ever lived, filled with a mixture of naked fear and impotent rage, shook his fist at an enemy he couldn't see. You devils! You devils! So I'm in W.G. Grace's garden at the back of the house at Fairmount in Mottingham. It's a sunny late summer day as we stand here now. It's very warm. And I think it's the sort of day that would have drawn WG out of the house into the garden when he had no cricket on. And he might have just sat in a chair and looked at his asparagus and felt pretty satisfied with life, really. But of course, that's always tempered by the knowledge that something dreadfully sad happened in this garden as well. It was the 9th of October, 1915. He'd been spooked by the Zeppelins. He was worried about the way the war was going. Two of his sons were involved in the war. And he had a a stroke in the back garden. This great sporting colossus and this incredibly vigorous, vibrant man was suddenly reduced to something much less than that. 
and we're here just inside the front door. It's a big grand hallway space, and uh, there's some caricatures and drawings of WG and and the ashes urn in a frame on the wall on one side. It's a residential care home now for the elderly. We're just walking up the stairs now from the hallway up to the first floor where WG's bedroom would have been. Early in the morning on the 23rd of October 1915 in this room WG Grace passed away. Although I'm trying to find the real man behind the caricature and behind the myth, I'd rather remember him a year or more earlier, leaping out of bed in this room, rushing over to the window that I'm standing opposite now, pulling back the curtains, making sure it's not raining, seeing a bright sunny day and thinking, yes, I've got a game of cricket this afternoon. And eventually he'd be walking out of this room, going down the stairs that are behind me just outside the door here, into the hallway where his cricket bag will be packed and waiting for him. He'd heave it onto his shoulder, open the door, and head out into the sunshine whistling to wherever he was going to play for Elton Cricket Club that day. I felt that I had had enough before the day was on. And you join me at the Marvels Lane ground in South London, idyllic location for this club match between Eltham and Grove Park, the 25th of July, 1914. Not a huge crowd has turned up to watch this afternoon. They're having their picnics around the ground because out there in the middle is Dr W.G. Grace at the age of 66 and he's made runs this afternoon. He is 68 not out as Eltham are moving towards the end of their innings. That day he felt younger than he had for a long time. His eye was in, the ball was hitting the middle of the bat and cricket felt easy again in a way that it hadn't felt for a long time. He was 66 years old at this point. And Grace gets another delivery on his pads there. He turns that into the onside and he jogs through for a single. He can only jog those runs these days. I think Grace lived for these games, and particularly for the moment when the bowler released the ball and for a split second he was no longer an old man with a grey beard and aching joints. At that moment, nothing else mattered. At that moment, as the ball came towards him, WG Grace's world was perfect. There was some of the old Dr Grace about that innings. 69 not out and the score 155 for six. Grace has drawn the innings to a close.